Good afternoon and welcome to a, another episode of Have Game Will Travel. I am Bennett Newsom, the esports strategist here at Full Sail University. You can find me on the internet as Damn It Bennett, but super excited uh, that you're here today. I've got one of my favorite guests uh, and good friend Matt Burns Potoff here with us today to talk about all things uh, Burns. So I'm really excited. Let's jump right in. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself, Matt. Hey, everybody. My name is uh, Matt Potoff, also known as Burns. I'm the general manager and vice president of esports at e United, and graduated from Full Sail in 2013. Heck yeah, Matt. Well, thank you for being here today. I I'm absolutely excited. Um, if you're in the chat today and you have questions for Matt, go ahead and just type them into the into the chat at any time. I'll grab them and I'll pull them into the, the conversation as needed. Uh, but Matt, uh, you know, first off, uh, obviously, I know your journey. Uh, we've had this conversation, I feel like, many times. <laughs> but, uh, you know, today for our viewers, tell them about how you got started in esports and gaming. Yeah, I'm uh, trying to figure out a different way to reciprocate everything <laughs> from the, from the beginning. Um, my story started just as any other normal gamer, uh, you know, just playing games for fun, whether it was on the PlayStation 1 or the Xbox. And eventually that led to me realizing that I was exceptionally good at first person shooter games. Uh, my friend in high school gave me a newspaper article that had an advertisement for a Halo 2 uh, LAN, and it was my very first LAN. I think the prize was just an Xbox 360, and we were trying to win it for my friend who didn't have one at the time. Uh, so that just goes to show you how far uh, esports has come <laughs> since, since a decade ago. Um, we ended up placing second at that tournament. But, so close. Uh, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> But it really fueled my competitive drive, and uh, that tournament displayed to me that I wanted to do this for a really long time. I loved competing. I loved meeting individuals that had the same interests as I did, and that really jump-started my career in yeah. St. Louis, just winning back-to-back uh, -back Call of Duty and Halo tournaments at the same time. And I did that all through high school. I was able to keep my parents away from forcing me into a minimum wage job. Right. Uh, I, that that paid for my phone bill, my lunch, and uh, some of my other you know gas money and small other uh, items. So I was fortunately able to you know <laughs> just stay on that path for uh, four years until going to full sale. That's awesome. Uh, so tell me, tell me about Shooter Burns. Uh, did you shorten it? Did everyone just start calling you Burns? Like, tell me the origin of of the of the gamer tag here. This is a great story. Um, my my favorite movie of all time is Happy Gilmore. <laughs> uh, I used to go. Uh, my dentist introduced me to it because he would always play movies as we were getting our teeth cleaned or right. getting a cavity. As I always had one back in the day, <laughs> and I loved uh, Shooter McGavin, yeah. uh, the the villain of the movie. I just thought he was absolutely hysterical. And I got home after getting an Xbox one day with my dad, and I made my Xbox Live account, and I tried doing Shooter McGavin, and <laughs> someone had already taken it. Right. And I didn't realize at the time that everyone put X's and O's or numbers after their name to still have the gamer tag that they right. wanted, but to just kind of give it a little bit of variation. So my dad, uh, he mentioned that, uh, I guess my grandma's maiden name was Burns before my grandpa married my grandma. So he thought it would be good to represent my other family in their honor since we had a whole bunch of like veterans and right. uh, that we had some great uncles that passed away in like Pearl Harbor uh, and just other, you know, veterans that had fought under the name Burns. So he yeah. decided to just uh, nudge me to make it Shooter Burns. And that's kind of what I went along with. And uh, it, it has a catchy name to it. Yeah. Ended up having to get rid of Shooter uh, when I started joining teams because some of them, the character limit was just way too yeah. long. So 
um, I think it's more appropriate in this day and age too to just have Burns instead of a shooter as right. well. So, <laughs> but it, it does, it is catchy. I think that's a, a really cool thing too. I, I actually never knew that story either. So thanks for mm-hmm. sharing that. Um, uh, but yeah, you're right, man. So many times you see so many people have different names and names and names and names, and eventually you land on that one. Uh, and, yep. then, and then it sticks, which is which is great. So uh, I said this last episode, uh, my favorite game, the first game that I ever fell in love with was Doom. Uh, and it was when my parents got me uh, the, the 32X, which is the thing that you put on top of your Sega uh, to give it 32 bits or whatever. And uh, that was the it was like, like an eye opening thing for me. And, that, and I fell in love with that for you. What was the, the first game that you ever truly like loved? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um I remember back in the day, like Crash Bandicoot, Army Men, uh, Twisted Metal. Twisted I Metal. played. I love those games so much. But Halo Two is really the game that got me sucked into realizing that competitive gaming could be a thing. Uh, I remember watching uh, like the Ogre Twins and yep. Walshy and a bunch of the OGs of the Halo community playing on USA TV. And I'm like, holy crap, like there's gamers on TV playing for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. This is so cool. Um, but I would say Halo 2 was the one that really, you know, catapulted my my drive to try to become like a professional gamer. Yeah. And, and to kind of continue on that, like you you caught your first I would say like break with with Call of Duty Ghosts. Is that right? Yes, I did. Um, oh, so, awesome. yeah, I uh, I guess to go into a little bit more detail with that, uh, I had a ton of mediocre placings when I first started. Uh, I placed seventeenth, then seventeenth again, then I failed to make champs for Black Ops Two, um, and Black Ops Two was like. That was the game where Call of Duty, in my opinion, just really took off. Yeah. Um, and I unfortunately missed out on all of the big tournaments, but I still gained a ton of experience. And I think that experience and at least showcasing what I could do at tournaments led me to you know, become successful in the next Call of Duty title. Uh, Ghost is one of my favorite games. I think uh, Search and Destroy in that game was one of the best game modes, had some of the most balanced maps, and there's a, a lot of iconic moments uh, from that game and competitive Call of Duty history. Yeah, no, for sure. That's, I mean, that really kind of probably set the stage for you and that that first experience of, of kind of going into your pro career, which I think for our viewers would be would be great to hear is is kind of walk us through the progression as a player like where it started and like even how the knowledge of playing helped you in what you do today all right here we go here's a 10 minute story bennett (laughs) perfect i love it (laughs) all right um i first started playing in world at war Uh, I played a ton of game battles with a team called clan cleaning products uh, everyone had a different name uh, that was tailored towards a laundry detergent or <laughs> uh, <laughs> a dry cleaner. Like I was Tide before I became Burns. Like I decided to change my name to Tide because I joined this team. Right. And it was a family. It was uh, 12 of us. And basically who, uh, whoever was on at night would be the starter of the team. And we were like third or fourth on GBs uh, for World at War. And that's where I first started competing against the names of like Karma and some of the the players that were so freaking good at COD and you knew they were going to do like big things in their career. Yeah. Um, After a year of doing that, I realized that I had a ton of fun playing in that type of environment, but I wanted to take it to the next level and just join a team of four. I ended up starting my own team called Deathwish, and that was in Modern Warfare 3. I traveled to three UMG events in Chicago. I placed third, uh, fourth, and I believe third again. Uh, Like Team Fear and Obey and Envy were some of the teams that flew out to the tournament. And at that time, they were really the only sponsored teams I was just able to kind of round up some Midwest kids and drive up to this tournament in Chicago and try to prove my worth as a player. Right. Um, Modern Warfare 3 wasn't supported by uh, MLG or 
uh, any type of competitive league, UMG was really trying to establish themselves as the Call of Duty uh, home for competitive esports. And they played a huge role in getting uh, MLG back into COD, in my opinion, because yeah. of all the work that they did throughout um, uh, Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 3, and Black Ops 2 as well. Um, so fast forward a few years, I am I quit gaming to play tennis. I went all in on tennis in high school for one year. I was still playing uh, on the side, but this was during my time of just kind of playing at tournaments with my friends, winning cash in St. Louis, just playing tennis, sports, and uh, still kind of figuring out what I was going to do next in my life. Um, full sale. Yep. popped up i loved everything full sale had to offer my dad uh, nudged me into doing web design and development ended up switching degrees to entertainment business a year later graduated uh, during my time at full sale i was still in that shell of knowing i wanted to go pro and call of duty but i was essentially just staying warm and not really putting a hundred percent into it because of the intense schedule that right. we have at full sale. So I was still competing at tournaments. Uh, I was still flying to uh, Chicago and St. Louis for a few tournaments. Uh, I went to Dallas for one, um, but I really wasn't able to put all of my eggs in one basket because I was determined to get my degree before really making sure, uh, you know, I had an equal backup plan in case right. gaming didn't work out. Uh, five months before I graduated from Full Sail, uh, it was Modern Warfare 3. I won, you know, I've told this story many <laughs> times, but I won a $25,000 tournament down the street from Full Sail. Uh, it was through a company called Play and Trade. They no yep. longer exist, but they're basically GameStop. It's, it's just another GameStop. Uh, the way the tournament worked is every Play and Trade held a local tournament. The winner of that free for all tournament played all of the Play and Trades in their state, and then they played all of the Play and Trades in their region, which was split up into Midwest west northeast and southeast i believe and then the grand finals after somehow making it there um i still i still remember this 16 year old girl showing up to uh the first play and trade tournament and i'm you know i consider myself really good and my very first interaction like she somehow killed me i'm like this girl is gonna win the whole tournament and my <laughs> career is over <laughs> And I congratulated her afterwards as well because uh, she was taking it like very seriously. I'll never forget that moment though. Uh, yeah, and then finals of that tournament, I used a, a personal mini radar. Everything was allowed. So I took full advantage of yeah. everything that Modern Warfare 3 had to offer. Uh, it's still such an iconic moment that I'll never forget because they had proximity voice on. You could hear what the opponents what your opponents were saying if they were within 10 or 15 feet of you in the game and i had this mini <laughs> radar set i'm literally camping a corner because it's twenty five thousand yeah. dollars. like i got to do what i got to do to make this money <laughs> so i put this this radar down on myself and i can see on the mini map you know where they're coming from basically and i got three four kills and then i changed my spot again and i basically built this huge lead in the first map and then everyone caught on to what i was doing and they started doing it too but then we were playing these maps that were like way more open and uh, essentially all of your points added up through the four maps so even if you had like a rough map one you could do good in maps two three and four yeah. and still win the whole thing um, fortunately I played exceptionally well, the first three maps and I had like a 20 kill lead and I somehow won this whole thing on my birthday. Uh, my classmate Frankie from full sale yeah. came and, uh, filmed it on his phone for me. And, uh, it was just such a special moment because, uh, for me, I've been, you know, you're talking about seven years or so of playing games 
for fun and for cash and somewhat competitively, but winning $25,000, I mean, I can't say it was a life changing money, but I was able to put that towards my student loans. Yeah. I was able to take $2,000 of that and sponsor myself to go to these tournaments because sponsors weren't really a th- they were a thing, but there wasn't so many organizations that were willing to bet on players as there are now. Yeah. Um, so I was able to bet on myself and those tournaments didn't work out for me, but that was during black ops too. And I was yeah. flying, flying myself to tournaments and just trying to prove my worth. Um, call of duty ghost came out. I due to my lack of top eight performances, I got a real job. I was working as an internet marketing consultant uh, for a web company, selling websites to lawyers, kind of taking after what my dad did for a decade because he had a, <laughs> his book of business and a lot of people knew who he was in Missouri. So I thought I would kind of start there and see if I can make some sales. And I did. It was fun. But of course, I would rather play Call of Duty professionally right. than sell websites to people. <laughs> uh, so my very last tournament, uh, I can't, you know, I can't believe it all worked out the way it did. I told my dad and my family that if I don't place top eight at this tournament, that I'm just going to give up gaming and just, you know, work, uh, mm-hmm. the job that I thought could just pay my bills, which would probably be that internet marketing consulting job. Uh, I placed fifth, uh, with Machilla, Revan and Nex who also lived in St. Louis with me. He was like one of the other top gamers in my city, but we never really met. But we were both free agents at the time and thought we could do some damage in UMG Philadelphia. And that led to us making a crazy open bracket run. Uh, We beat Clayster and Team Caliber first round of winner's bracket, which was a massive upset. And that tournament landed me on Curse New York Um, And that was my first professional contract, um, which wasn't much, but it was enough to be like, okay, this is my first contract. I'm getting paid. And I finally have an organization that's going to pay for my travel and my hotel and treat this seriously. Um, That's that's awesome. I was going to say, I mean, you've been on roughly like 16 pro teams, like including cloud nine team liquid and obviously United. Um, is that as exciting as it sounds or was it like stressful? I always think of like hockey. I know you're a hockey fan. I'm a hockey fan, but seeing players get traded and just have to pick up their stuff and move one day. Do you feel kind of, was it that type of stress that you had when going from team to team or was it, um, you know, (sighs) Hey, I'm excited. I think the biggest, I, it is extremely stressful, uh, playing professionally because there's so many like inner politics with it. Yeah. It's just like players talking with one another. And if you aren't able to ride certain waves or talk to certain people and essentially increase your stock, which right. is what we call it. Okay. <laughs> it, it can, it can really things outside of your control can determine your career. Yeah. Um, I felt I had, a very like consistent career. Um, I played when Ghost came out, we were like a top six, top eight team. We placed fourth at Anaheim. We placed fifth at UMG Nashville. And we had a good showing throughout the yeah. year. Um, and for example, when Advanced Warfare came out, that was my best Call of Duty when Jetpacks got introduced to the Call of Duty scene. And we placed fifth at Champs in the very beginning of the season. I had a team that no one even expected was going to make the championship. And then not only did we make it, but we beat optic nation. We beat, um, the best Australian team. We beat two other teams to then lose to phase and place fifth, which was my biggest payout at a tournament outside of the free for all, which was a $70,000 as a team. So we each made like, $17,000 17000 or $15,000 each after um, our organization's cut and some other stuff. But to put that into perspective and to answer your question, placing fifth at the biggest Call of Duty tournament of all time, me personally thinking I had a stellar tournament as an objective player, 
um, because there were roles at that time. Uh, now everything's become one person can kind of maybe do it all depending on the circumstances. But my team really thought I was more objective minded and I was always baiting myself and, and putting myself in a situation to do all the dirty work. Yeah. Um, so I thought I was going to catch a break and maybe get poached by another org or another team and potentially surround myself with players that could hopefully elevate my career, but that never happened. Um, and I, I wasn't disappointed. Um, but I have always been, even at United managing, I've always have worked with scrappy, hungry, amateur players that are wanting to prove something. And it's just in my DNA at this point. I, uh, it's, it's hard to, it, it, I think it would be really hard for me to just get handed like the best roster possible because it just seems that I'm always building teams from the ground floor. And mm -hmm. even when I played, I was, I was basically playing with outcasts, like people that were getting dropped from other teams. Um, and then we would form and try to make a miracle run happen or something, which uh, I, that's why I think I'm a great manager. I teamed with so many personalities, teamed with, learned so many different variations of team dynamics on all 16 different orgs I was on. And I've always essentially have been like the manager of my teams. I negotiated the contracts on behalf of all my players. So it seems I've just been doing this for yeah. you know, the past 10 years or so. Playing multiple roles, you know, that's, and I think that's great. I think, you know, when you have those skills and you're able to bring them into the other things that you're passionate about too, it really can lend to opening up doors that may not have been there for everybody else. Right. Because you, you stepped up and took it on a challenge that was outside the normal, you know, just play the game type of thing. Right. Yeah. No, I, I did. And I still think about it on how blessed I really am. Um, you know, maybe I could say it was like a factor of hard work because I, when I was at Full Sail, it was school and video games <laughs> and, that, and that's it. And this is embarrassing to say, and I've probably told you and Tracy and Sari and Jacob maybe one or two times, but I did not go to the beach one time. <laughs> while I lived in Florida for three years. And I tell people that, and they're just dumbfounded. Yeah. <laughs> and for me, I was kind of living in my bubble. Yeah. I had full sale. I was so focused on my schoolwork and getting my projects done and having perfect attendance. And then I would go home and grind Call of Duty and prep myself for just staying warm and being ready for to have like four or six more hours a day instead of only having two or three when I got back to my apartment to play. Um, so it's just crazy how everything worked out the way it did. Yeah, There was multiple times where I had to win or place in a certain, uh, you know, uh, format to keep my career going. And that ultimately prolonged my career to even get a shot at becoming a manager yeah. uh, for E United. So it's it's just baffling to think about sometimes. Yeah, and I feel like that's a good transition. And again, uh, for all the viewers out there, if you have a question for Matt, just type it into the chat, and we'll we'll bring him in uh, to the conversation. Uh, but obviously, being you have a really cool perspective because you've been a pro and now you're the VP of esports and the GM of e United. Uh, so seeing as you've kind of seen both, what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen in the pro scene from when you played to today? Ooh, the first I'll start off with is the salary. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the easy one, right? Like, <laughs> Oh my goodness. These kids are making way too much money. Well, I mean, when I played, I was making 500 bucks a month. Wow. Like that was my salary with some Chick-fil-A for yeah. once a week Chick-fil-A and our rent was covered. But now, I mean, you can enter a tier three or a tier four title and you're making that much. Yeah. Um, and obviously league and Overwatch and even COD and the franchise leagues, the salaries are out of control, which is well-deserved for a few of the players. Um, but it's, People are making a career out of this. It's not like it, how it was back in the day. Yeah. Um, I think the resources has changed. Uh, coaches weren't really a thing 
outside of a few teams that really bought into that. Um, and now there's coaches for almost every single team across every title for the top 20 to 24 teams. They have their own general manager. Some teams have their own, you know, uh, sports psychologist or right. a mental health therapist or someone who will massage their arms and their hands before matches at some tournaments. I, that's just the way mm-hmm. things have progressed and it's all for the better. Yeah. It makes, it sets new standards in our industry. And I, I wish some of these, <laughs> I always <laughs> wish some of this stuff was happening back in the day, but that you can't, that stuff's completely out of your control. And, um, those are the biggest two, though. Yeah. Uh, resources and salary for yeah, me. Definitely the the supporting business aspect of that is is here, and th- and I feel like that's kind of what this whole show is about: is to talk to people like you uh, that uh, are in that industry, that are are part of that, and that there's um, you know opportunities outside of just playing the game, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, so speaking to that, I know that either watching the VOD or here in chat, we have a, a, a ton of aspiring pro players in the audience. What what co- what sort of advice would you share with them to help uh, them focus on making the right moves uh, and, and taking them to that next step in going pro? My biggest regret when I played was I thought I um, I thought I was doing everything the right way when I played and I was very defensive when it came to receiving criticism at times. Mm -hmm. And I really never had like a coach or a manager or like a very smart middleman teammate at times to kind of bridge that gap and get me to wake up. So the two biggest factors that can really expedite your uh, mental approach when it comes to pursuing a professional career is watching yourself play just taking the time to watch yourself play and watch others play and how they approach the game i i had so much pride and so much of an ego when i played uh specifically for probably through black ops 2 and maybe even in a ghost where i was like oh my my gun skill is so freaking i knew my gun skill was good that's yeah. that's what's always bailed me out of situations is my gun skill even if i put myself in the wrong spot i would still win a gunfight that i shouldn't and that's ultimately what led me to have a a prosperous career but i never went back and watched what skump did or mm-hmm what Nate shot might do in this situation or um, what other competitors did because I had so much pride where I was like, Oh, because I'm a pro, maybe I don't need to watch them play. Like if I just keep shooting bots or if I keep playing, I'm just going to somehow continue to get better. And that was a very unrealistic way of looking at my career. Um, I could have taken an hour less out of my day to watch other players who have won and right. see what they do or even go back to watch my own play and maybe even ask a teammate to watch over my film and be like, Hey, is there anything that you can recommend that I can do better? And just kind of have like an open mind yeah. about the way people give you advice. Yeah. Uh, it's take, it took me a long time to get to that point, And uh, I wish I would have had the mental capacity to, be more open-minded to criticism and my own gameplay and watching other competitors as well. Yeah. And I think that's so true. And I think that applies to so many other things too, even in like the world of streaming, right? Actually watching your content back and like processing that experience, right? Especially if you're trying to entertain and you're watching it and you're not entertained yourself, that's a good way to go. Okay. I got to make some changes. Right. So great, great advice, obviously. Um, Let's jump to this first question here. Um, this is from the chat. Um, so it says, uh, uh, who are the best types of people to network with, uh, uh, to get involved with the business side of tier one organizations such as United? Oof. Uh, I would say events in general are just the best way to meet anyone from any tier one or tier two esports organization. Uh, I think Bennett can even attest to this. Like when we were at 
HCS rally and yeah. we had our own booth at the event and FaZe has their own booth and Sentinels has their own booth. All of their staff members are just centrally located by their booth and they're they're just hanging out, they're yeah. talking to people and all it takes is one good conversation, one good first impression, a business card and um just being, you know, professional mm -hmm. and showing your interest and that could lead to an opportunity whether it's a junior level position or an internship that leads to something greater. Uh events are definitely the best way to get like that one-on-one -on -one attention. Online, I've always said before, just being uh, professionally persistent, always, you know, emailing or tweeting at the organizations that you love, like once every two or three weeks where you're not doing it every single day, but you're just making them aware of, hey, I'm a really good graphic designer. Here's some work that I've done. Or if you're a video editor and you've put together a montage for your favorite Valorant or Halo or Super Smash player, you can just literally tweet them that yeah. and be like, hey, this is something that I did. I really love you guys. I want to work for you. And eventually, I'm always under the impression that uh, those opportunities will lead to something fruitful, uh, whether it's like a conversation. I've always, like if there isn't a, a position open at e United or even an internship open at e United, I always tell someone that's worthy of a position that, hey, I'm going to look out for you. I'm going to do my absolute best to keep you in the back of my head for when I'm talking to other organizations and because there right. there's always need for that type of talent. Yeah. And I, I, I totally agree with you on that. And I think it's really important too, especially if you're going up and you're introducing yourself to uh, the employees of these orgs, uh, you know, first impressions are really important. Um, and especially if you go in there asking for something, that's not always a good one, right? So going in there, maybe offering something or, if yep. you are a graphic designer and, and you you've or a video editor and you've made, you know, a highlight reel and doing exactly what you said, tagging, you know, the org about that, it, it can really make a, a better impression than, oh, hey, can I get a jersey? <laughs> you know, like yeah, if you're exactly. always looking for something, it's it's not always going to be a great thing. So obviously being a fan is huge, but also being able to bring something to the table uh, that you're, you're, you know, you're giving them uh, is 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 definitely something to, to, to really think about. Um, obviously fast forward to now, uh, tell me what the day in the life of the GM and, and VP of esports at EU United is like, boy, uh, day to day is always different. Um, I usually spend my time talking and collaborating with my, uh, my colleagues at EU United. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a director of, you know, social media. We have two graphic designers and then we have, a a video editor and someone who travels with all of our teams. So a lot of our work really is tailored on the media side. Uh, we have partner obligations that we're completing for our sponsors and for games that we're intertwined with. Uh, we're talking about what social media posts could be extremely funny. And uh, usually when I bring up ideas, I get shut down, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, but Will, I, I can't express it enough how talented my team is. Uh, we have a ton of fun every single day. Uh, I give a lot of people the room to just kind of be themselves and do work at their own pace because we've been working with each other for so long. I just know that they're going to do great work. Um, so outside of the media stuff, I'm reaching out to partners. I'm trying to see what game is going to be the next big thing. Uh, I'm trying to establish uh, E-United in a way where we're strategically partnering with developers and um, we're getting value in return instead of it being the other way around. There's yeah. a lot of leagues where um, you're just constantly throwing money in hopes that your team is going to win. And that's the only way to get revenue back unless you're selling sponsors against your team. And we try to put ourselves in a position where we're working with developers that are offering in-game items or they're offering a potential stipend for creating content around the game. And that creates a real true business model yeah. for esports instead of just praying and watching your team that they're going to win the whole thing and you're going to be yeah. able to recoup some of that prize money. Um, but my favorite part of the day outside of working with my colleagues and catching up with partners that we have and 
trying to network and uh, kind of expand EU United's goals and initiatives is working with our players and our teams. Um, we have, you know, weekly or daily catch up calls. Um, I'm talking with players individually on personal problems they might be dealing with. I am talking with the team to see how we can get players to meet each other in the middle and ultimately create a safe structure and kind of like a programming schedule where we're making daily and weekly goals and we're not just like showing up the scrim just to show up and, right. and see what happens. Uh, it's really important that you have initiative and that everyone's on the same page. Yep. And even though it's not sometimes uh, and things will never be perfect and teammates might hate each other. <laughs> uh, this is a business yep. and we really strive to get our players to meet each other in the middle and not ultimately like just make like a quick fix. Right. So I think that's just like in our culture. Um, and sometimes that leads to 12 to 14 hour work days. And my wife absolutely hates me for it. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I tell her this and I tell my players this too, um, you know, in, in my contract, I'm obviously obligated to help out our players and right. help out and travel with all of our teams, but there's not like a set time limit. Like I am there to work with my guys out of my own free will, because I want to see them succeed. And I want to be a general manager that I didn't have previously yeah. when I played so they can just purely focus on the game and, and nothing else. And uh, some players really appreciate it. Some don't think anything about it because that's just what they're used to. But um, at the end of the day, I know what I bring to a team and the best value I can bring is kind of after the the nine to five aspects of the organization. And there's another great question from chat that I think, um, you know, really um, kind of ties into what we're talking about is how do you uh, maintain a healthy work life balance? Uh with, with all the things that you're doing? That's a great freaking question. Uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll be pretty transparent. Um, I, like on a personal struggle of mine, I have not had a schedule over the last decade. I, being a pro gamer outside of Full Sail, you know, I live in a teaming, I live in a gaming house with four other five other gamers right. like we went to bed at 3 a.m woke up whenever we wanted then we would scrim at three in the afternoon and then play our matches at six or 8 p.m and i've never had a structured schedule and it's a severe weakness of mine yeah. um even even to you know like a month ago i would still wake up at like 9 or 10 a.m which is okay but I'm working then until 10 or 11 at night. So it's still like a 12 hour work day. So what I've started doing last Monday is setting my alarm for 7 a.m. Uh, I'm going to the gym immediately, getting it out of the way just to get outside, get some type of mm -hmm. interaction with normal people, get a good healthy workout in. I come home, I eat, I shower. And by that time, it's like 8.30 in the morning or 9 a.m. And I can kind of bring some structure to like my life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's something that I'm trying to do um, outside of that. Before, even while not being on like a structured schedule, I, I take walks. I still work out occasionally. I try to go out with my friends as much as I can on the weekends when I have time. Um, I definitely take time to eat dinner with my wife every night <laughs> uh, and spend time with her. But ultimately, I really love what I do. And that's why I work so much. Because if I didn't like this, I would not be able to work 10 to 12 hour days. Yeah. I just really enjoy working with our players. I love watching video games. I love watching our teams progress and get better and better. Um, through proper coaching and them realizing different like mindsets and perspectives on how to grow as a player, which ultimately grows the team. And that's what I love to do. I, I don't want to do anything else in life. Uh, I absolutely 
you know, could do this yeah. every single day until, until I die. So that's my, that's my issue is I love this so much. I work too much. Yeah. And, uh, that's why I've tried to bring some structure into my life to make sure that I'm, I'm being healthy for myself, even though it's working too much could yeah. uh, seem like a problem that hey, I don't see. Yeah. But I, I, you know, you're, I appreciate you being vulnerable there because I, I think there's so many people that are in that same boat where it's, it's all the time. It's you're on, on all the time. And, and that's hard sometimes. And it definitely takes a toll. So I, I love the, that you're setting your alarm, you're getting up. Uh, I'm going to take a page out of your book and do the same and, and get, <laughs> get back into shape. Right. Uh, which obviously I, I think is, is super important to having that balance, it, whether it's gaming or, or work, you know, taking a break, going and doing something is, is going to be much, much more beneficial to you in the long run um, than just, you know, grinding the whole time. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, obviously, we'll keep going. Uh, huge moment for you. 2019, uh, United won back-to-back -to -back, uh, tournament titles in COD. Uh, just talk to me about that point in your career, that roster. It was huge. Uh, and just really the wins in general. What, what was going through you uh, emotionally at that time? Like yeah, You're it, making me teary-eyed <laughs> right now, man. It was big. Uh, it was a big moment. I I mean I say this a lot that was that was the pinnacle of my professional career um not only as a player but just combined overall as as a manager too um working with the twins and uh gunless and then Clayster and having all of these legendary players kind of mixed together where you have like Clayster who I competed against for so long and I hated him because he's so <laughs> freaking good and he just he knows how to read sub players so well so it's like you had to think to kind of outmaneuver him on the map because he can just hold a whole lane by himself but seeing our team win back to back with that um, with that roster is just immeasurable. Uh, so much joy. Clayster, I think, was on a 1,300-day drought of not winning a championship when we won the Miami Finals. So what a moment for him. And for the Twins, you know, they started off hot with the United. We won our very first event in 2017 at MLG Atlanta with the Twins, Gunless, and Silly. You have three amateur players that had never really proven themselves. They were being called online warriors. They maybe played on main stage like one time before that. And they flew through the winner's bracket, won the whole event against a crowd that had me as the only fan. For <laughs> them. And then they also went on a two and a half year or two year drought where they were trying to prove that they could win again. And we were so close so many times, but that led to um, them being doubtful. Uh, we, uh, we had some confidence issues on if the team was going to work out. And I feel the biggest part that I played was just trying to keep the team together and trying to make them realize that we had something special there. Um, and that was the only part that I was able to play uh, outside of picking up Bryce Facento, who was my previous old teammate. And I knew what he brought to a team, uh, his communication, his leadership, um, just the intangible skills that he brings to a team. Once again, uh, can't compare it to any other teammate that I've had. And having him and the acquisition of simp and a bz with the mixture of the twins and clay it was just a perfect storm yeah. and um we we had a great ride uh those guys made a statement for themselves and they're continuing to make a statement for themselves even now um and i was able to live my my uh kind of like my pro player dreams through them yeah. because obviously winning the freaking world <laughs> championship it is so hard to do yeah like we we could have lost in two or three different series uh in the 2019 call of duty world championship we almost lost the eg which had jcap on it 
Jay Cap was previously on E United that year. So that was a massive series, massive rivalry between both Clay and Jay Cap uh, that year. But winning, I mean, I have, you know, I I'll try to move my my webcam. Here we got oh yeah. We got the whole storyboard up there of me playing. And yeah. then obviously you have uh, you know, two COD World Championship pictures and our 2019 finals and I have my uh, my jersey behind me too. Yep. So, you know, I walk into this office every day seeing those memories and that's what sets the standard for me. I want to do that in other games. I want to do that with other players. Um, I believe we have what it takes to do that in any game yep. uh, if we set our mind to it. So that really set the bar for me and I want to do it again in another game. Yeah, definitely. Well, and, and that's, you know, a good point after you guys won, that was when the transition from the CWL to the CDL started, yep. uh, which unfortunately was an end for EU United in the COD scene. Um, tell our audience, uh, you know, what titles are you guys uh, competing in currently? Yeah, right now we are in Halo, Rocket League, PUBG, Gears of War, uh, we have a couple content creators focus on Apex Legends and Mario Kart even. Shout out the Bear. He's he's killing it in Las Vegas with the Mario Kart tournaments. Uh, and then we also have Jen, who is our first female brand ambassador and content creator at United, who is a rock star in the Halo yeah. community. Um, so we're really happy with the assets and players that we have. Uh, and we're hoping to expand into even more titles this year and hopefully even get back into some franchise leagues. The, uh, the economics at times are kind of yeah. really hard to dive into. Um, but, you know, with COD specifically, we, we were able to end with the biggest bang <laughs> yeah. on top when there was 254 teams around the world competing. So uh, I, you know, there's... I, I'm I'm cool with everything right yeah. now. Like I'm, we did that. We accomplished what we needed to, and hopefully, there's a day where we're back. And yeah. I I would love to manage another Call of Duty team, but I'm really having fun uh, with Rocket League and Halo and just new communities that mm -hmm. I've never been a part of. It's it's really fun working with all the different players that we have right now. Yeah, and obviously, uh, EU United just locked in a, a brand new deal with Scuff, uh, adding them to an already you know great list of sponsors. Uh, talk to me from like the business side of esports. What does a sponsor like this, um, you know, kind of bring to the table for your team? Uh, what does that What does that look like? Yeah, I think with any partnership, you know, e even like when recruiting players, like they look at what sponsors you might have, and that ultimately <laughs> can sometimes lead to them picking your organization over another, depending on like what controller they use mm -hmm. or what care packages they're going to get when you first sign to an organization. But mm -hmm. uh, I was the first COD pro to use a scuff in 2013. I think I am. Maybe other people can prove me wrong. You heard it here but, first. Uh, though, so it's on <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was knifing people so fast. I was gliding across the map in Modern Warfare 3. And everyone was like, what are you using? I'm like, I'm using a scuff. And they changed the game forever. I yeah. mean, you have so many COD pros who used it. Um, and we just have a very long lasting relationship with those guys. They, they know what we do. They know what we excel in. Uh, they trust us to make good content and in return, you know, that comes with, uh, sponsored, uh, controllers for all of our players to use. It comes with us being able to activate them at tournaments and online, and it comes with additional perks as well. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun. We're uh, super happy to have yeah. them a part of the United family. Well, let's take another uh, question from chat here. Um, this is, uh, what are things players can do to set themselves apart, uh, outside of the game resumes, presentations. What is the secret sauce? My boy, Zach. <laughs> so funny story about Zach is that, uh, he worked with the United as an intern and now he's absolutely killing it. 
super proud of him. Uh, that that was the show, Bennett, where we had individuals play Call of Duty with us. Mm-hmm. And yep. Zach stated that he loved anime. And I'm like, yep, let's uh, let's pick him up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let me see this again. What are things players can do to set themselves apart outside of the game? Hmm. I think resumes are important. Uh, presentations, somewhat. I, I think with me, and this is a differing opinion that a lot of individuals have. Um, I am such a pure competitive player that a lot of the strategic hires that I have made for coaching positions and analyst positions usually comes down uh, to players who have played the game in and out and have like that that sauce that Zach is talking yeah. about where for me it's like the players resonate with that analyst or coach because they've been in their shoes so as it pertains to individuals like Zach who are proficient and excel in, in social media marketing and media I try to look at gamers or any individual who actually understands the landscape, knows specific games like in and out. They know all of the players. They know their favorite champions. And uh, I think I stated this at a full sale panel, but even for myself, just learning the basics of like every esport game out there is crucial. Like if I go to a high res event, I need to be able to understand smite terminology and i need to be able to talk about uh road company and some of the champions and maps that are involved with that and that really impresses people where you might not know everything but you can at least start a conversation and that ultimately leads to them thinking like oh this guy's done his research like he knows what's up you've invested your time into the thing that they're passionate about right yeah for sure absolutely uh but but even with Zach, like he just did a presentation on himself. Uh, he's shown he's done like case studies on his best tweets and what's performed really well. Uh, and I think that's like extremely yeah. smart for any for any player or individual that it's just like a highlight reel for yep. video editors. Like they put their best clips and edits together into like a sixty second or ninety second montage for someone who can't showcase their editing skills you can put all of your best case studies into a document and then use that as a, a leverage tool to showcase what you're able to do with assets that you're working with. Yeah, I love that. That's right. awesome. And I, I say the same thing too, is any sort of media that you can prepare um, that sets you aside from everybody else. Um, if you're getting a ton of resumes, but then you get this video of you talking about and showing the things that you do. And uh, that's that's just, it sets you aside. So those types of things are always great. Um, Matt, you uh, recently joined, quote, the panel uh, for the eSports Awards. Uh, <laughs> first, you know, tell us about uh, that honor and, and what it's like weighing in on, uh, you know, the who's who of, of the industry. Um, but more importantly, what are some of the categories you're most excited to contribute to? Yeah, uh, I started, became a panel member last year for the eSports Awards. And for me, it's just a great learning experience as a whole because you get to network and meet with other people. There's just so many people in esports that specialize in certain categories. So they're able to pull all of these experts and these notable casters and even people who don't really show themselves on social media but they have so much experience on the back end on tournament operations or, or other factors of the industry. And you put them all in a room and you're able to really discuss at an intellectual level on why someone should be worthy of this award or why someone should be nominated for this award. Um, And shout out to uh, Bryce Blum and a lot of the guys over there because they they do exceptional work and uh, they do a great job organizing all the calls and kind of making sure that the discussions are on point. And it's been a great learning experience for me. I, uh, I contribute when it comes to call of duty, halo, uh, a lot of the titles that we're in. And when it comes to like league of legends and some other games, (laughs) I will uh, zip my mouth because (laughs) I, I know the best players, but I, I'm, you know, I'm cognizant that I'm not an expert in those fields and I will 
gladly allow others to speak and everyone gives each other like that mutual respect to allow others to talk about their specific games which leads to really fruitful discussions yeah i love that uh as the industry grows you know more and more students especially here at full sail um are looking to enter the industry of esports after graduation um being someone that's been you know kind of like a, a trailblazer in the industry uh, going from pro to, uh, you know, what you're doing now, what advice would you give them uh, as they start their journey in the business side of esports? Uh, for the business side of esports, just recognizing that if your dream org or dream opportunity doesn't happen, there are so many alternative routes to work in esports compared to just working with an esports organization. Uh, I know individuals that are now working at talent agencies that are representing some of the hottest content creators and streamers. And pre previously, they were, you know, like live streamers or just right. kind of working their way through the esports field. Uh, you have uh, networking sites, you have a ton of social apps that are coming out for gamers. Uh, the amount of activations from non endemics moving into the esports world is crazy collegiate is blowing up like no other high school esports is finally getting its foot on the ground uh i've had a lot of individuals that are eager in esports that couldn't work their way into the professional level so then they started and got an opportunity at collegiate or in high school and they're doing really good work and over time through that experience and through those trials you'll eventually start networking and you know, show what you've done at that level and hopefully an opportunity arises at the pro scene if that's truly like what you want to do. Yeah, absolutely. And so we have a, a bunch of uh, Full Sail and Armada alums that uh, are starting their own programs across the country uh, working working in the uh, collegiate scene. So there's always opportunity like that, which is great. Um, uh, for our viewers here, uh, we only have a couple more questions left, but if you have a question for Matt that you want to ask, just type it into the chat. And we'll pull it in. But um, uh, going back to um, kind of your transition from player to GM, uh, did you encounter any any roadblocks, um, you know, uh, as you transitioned from a player to, you know, working the business side? And, and, and how did you solve those problems? Uh, I think my biggest hurdle and roadblock was <laughs> was not qualifying for a tournament as a pro player, which then led me into this disarray uh, position where I, I couldn't figure out what was next. And I needed three or four months to kind of get my stuff together to land an opportunity to even work for United. Okay. Uh, I have to give a massive shout out to uh, Daniel Clerkey, as I always do. Uh, he was my manager uh, for my last gaming event and kind of led me to the position I am now. Um, so really, you know, my roadblock was slashed apart and opened up through another person giving me an opportunity to work on the back end. And uh, I, I always say it, there's, you know, billions of people in this world. All it takes is one person to kind of give you that opportunity to prove yourself and uh give you an opportunity to make a statement and and show what you can do and uh, i'm super grateful that uh dan was able to kind of take my roadblock off the streets right. and give me that path to uh, success yeah i love that i think that really goes to show just being you know yourself being passionate you know being a hard worker and and other people can see that right and and they say hey here's a here's an opportunity you know, I see that you've made this effort. You're doing these great things and, and that opens the door. So um, that's definitely great advice, uh, you know, for anybody out there that is maybe encountering some of those issues. Um, well, the final question I have for you today is where do you see uh, the future of esports in the next five to 10 years? Uh, but more specifically, where do you see the role of professional leagues in the, in, in the esports industry? Whew, that's solid questions right there. Um, I see, and then over the next decade, I see developers and publishers really acknowledging the weight and how powerful esports organizations actually are. 
and they can start to really consider how much work and resources we put into their titles to ultimately market their players and grow the game as a whole, which will hopefully lead to bigger and brighter partnerships for uh, organizations to stabilize and not you know, be in the red as much as some are at the moment. Um, I see that changing. Uh, I also see mobile games taking over. I'm desperately trying to figure out a way for E United to get into the mobile space. Uh, it's not as popular in NA as it is in other countries around the world, but I still believe that mobile gaming is going to be a huge factor. It, it is already a factor yeah. now, um, but I, I want to be a part of it somehow. Uh, I think virtual reality will get to a point where it becomes something really insane, but I, I just can't even comprehend what they're going to do with it yeah. and how it's even going to work. I think 10 or 15 years from now, like we all might have visors on and we're running around <laughs> in our offices. So I can't wait. I, it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> yeah. For, for me, that's what I just can't even. I can't gather the thoughts mm -hmm. on what they're going to do with VR and esports down the road. Um, but with mobile games, you know, like it's very expensive to acquire PCs oh, yeah. and virtual reality equipment and then all the other auxiliary like components that you need to make everything work. So mobile games, you just get your freaking phone and yeah. you're right there playing. It's in your pocket, uh, you know? Exactly. So. I uh, that's how I see the industry unfolding, and I only think collegiate and high school esports is going to continue to grow and ultimately continue like to raise the floor of esports, which will then affect the professional leagues and even higher than that. Absolutely. Well, Matt, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, tell everyone where they can find you, how to reach out to you uh, if they have questions. Um, uh, just give them all your in info. Yeah, for sure. So uh, my Twitter is at Potoff, P-O-T-T-H-O-F-F, -F, my last name. Uh, and then my email is in my bio as well on Twitter. I have it just blasted right there for every human being to see. So um, I do my absolute best to respond to any questions or concerns. Uh, always happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, feel free to shoot them over to me and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for watching. Have Game Will Travel. My name is Bennett Newsome. We will see you next time and have a great rest of your week. Thanks, Bennett.